1968, Doug Engelbart presented at the Stanford Research Institute at an event which has later been referred to as the mother of all demos. Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. But what events led up to that demo, and how do we get from those humble beginnings to the computer mice we know and love today? Nish here, and today we're taking a scroll through the history of the computer mouse. Now, Doug Engelbart is widely credited as the inventor of the computer mouse, but he wasn't actually the first to think about this idea of moving something to move a cursor somewhere. Like many consumer technologies, the first semblances of computer mice can be traced back to military organisations. Back in 1946, Ralph Benjamin of the British Royal Navy was really tired of using a joystick to track the positions of enemy aircraft. His solution to this was to use a ball, which then moved little rollers to move around the cursor. Now, while the device was patented, the Navy didn't end up going with it. They stuck to their joystick and the device didn't really see the light of day. And Ralph wasn't the only one. Kenyon Taylor, another Brit who was in the Canadian Navy, was also working on a similar coordinate tracking type system. His design also used a ball, except it was a Canadian bowling ball. Now these aren't as big as the normal bowling balls, but they still weigh a hefty one and a half kilos and have a 12 centimeter diameter. You can see the design here and it was a similar thing. The ball would move little rollers and that would be tracked. Now, neither of these inventions really got any further from those first military sightings. I guess militaries are quite secretive and it's just something very specialized. So this brings us back to Doug Engelbart. After finishing a doctorate in electrical engineering, Doug Engelbart took a post at the Stanford Research Institute in 1957, working on magnetic devices. In 1963, he embarked on a quest to advance human intelligence to a higher level by working on interface devices, a very noble quest. In one of his projects, he was curious about how planimeters could be used to track coordinate data. Now, for those who aren't clued up on obscure geometric tools of the 1950s, a planimeter is a device that's used to measure the area of arbitrary 2D shapes. And you can see in this video, there is a sort of resemblance of moving something around in XY coordinate space. Engelbart collaborated with Bill English to produce the first prototype of the mouse in 1964. And they were the ones apparently who came up with this term of mouse, given the, the shape of a mouse resembling a mouse his body and tail. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. As it moves up or down or sideways, so does the tracking spot. And the, the principles for its operation are quite easy to see. Can you hear me, Don? Would you turn it over and we'll see, right? Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. Their design differed a bit from the earlier trackball designs. There was instead two dials, one in the X and Y direction. Honestly, it looks pretty awkward to use, especially diagonally. Each of those wheels either slide sideways without rolling or rolls. You had to move in an arc like that to make the spot, the tracking spot go on a horizontal line but they did manage to get a patent in 1970. Unfortunately, Engelbart never really made much money from this invention, and the Stanford Research Institute licensed the idea to other larger companies for not too large sums of money. Given that that demo was at a research institute and computers weren't really much of a thing, that demo didn't really have much impact, but it wouldn't be long before some large industry players would enter into the picture. Now you may have heard of Xerox for their excellent printers, but back in the day they were a leading tech hardware company. In 1969, they established the Palo Alto Research Center in, you guessed it, Spain. No. Palo Alto, California, obviously. This was the home and fertile ground of countless innovations in computing, such as laser printers, ethernet, and GUIs. Now, Park managed to coax away a lot of the employees from the nearby Stanford Research Institute. That was the same one where Engelbart and Bill English worked on their first prototype. Engelbart stayed behind, but Bill English was one of the ones who made the switch. In 1972, English produced another mouse prototype, which was supplied with the Xerox Alto PC of 1973. And a Xerox machine presented your morning mail on a screen. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now at the Xerox Research Center in Palo Alto, California. This was a pretty big milestone because this was one of the first computers which came with a mouse included, although only about a thousand were made and they were all based in universities. We'd have to wait until 1982 until the first mass-produced computer came with a computer mouse, the Xerox 8010. I'd like to introduce you to the Xerox 8010 Star Information System. It consists of a processor, a large display screen, a keyboard, and a pointing device called the mouse. The mouse has a ball on the bottom that rotates as the mouse slides across a flat surface. 
This moves a cursor on the screen in corresponding motions. Now this wasn't a particularly popular product either. It might have had something to do with the $16,000 price tag, which is about $55,000 in today's money. Even the mouse that came included allegedly cost about $400 to make, and it was incredibly prone to breaking despite that price tag. So how did the mouse manage to make it to the mainstream? Well, one person who is perhaps excessively credited for this is this guy called Steve Jobs. You may have heard of him. In 1979, Apple bartered a deal with the venture capital arm of Xerox. Jobs and his engineers would get to have a nose around the Palo Alto Research Center, have a look at all of Xerox's cool inventions, and in return Xerox would get to buy 100,000 Apple shares at $10 a piece. A pretty good deal considering today's share price of about $60, I think. It was said that Jobs really liked the computer mouse, but that $300-$400 price tag was not going to work. He enlisted the Hovey Kelly design firm to work with his engineers, and they had the task of taking this useful but unreliable invention and turning it into something that could be really truly useful to consumers. Long story short, the design firm did a really good job and their design of the mouse ended up being a sort of blueprint going forwards. In classic Apple fashion, they went away with three buttons and changed it to one because who needs that kind of complexity? Engelbart has later been quoted to say that he felt that Apple dumbed down the uh, functionality of the mouse and I'd probably have to agree. After all of that development, Apple released their first consumer computer with a mouse included, the Lisa of 1983. Her name is Lisa and she's the most exciting thing to happen in computers today. Classic triumph for Apple. Pure and simple graphic images and a clever pointing device called a mouse. And this was followed up with the highly successful Macintosh of 1984. A quick side note on the technology front. These ball mice of the 1980s were actually what you'd call optomechanical in nature. So what was happening is the movement of the ball in these mouse would move discs, and these discs would chop optical signals, and then the sensors on the mouse could then calculate how many times that optical signal had been chopped to work out where and how far the mouse had moved. Fortunately, mouse development didn't end with these optomechanical mice. If you're unfortunate enough to have been acquainted, these are somewhat janky to use and the ball could get clogged with dirt and dust. The first optical mice were being researched in the 1980s, with some notable figures being Steve Kirsch of MIT and Richard Lyon of Xerox once again. What optical mice do is essentially take pictures of the surface they're moving on, extremely boring pictures, but then by studying the change in those pictures, they can determine how far and where the mouse has moved. While in optomechanical mice, we were using the movement of the ball to chop the signals, like I've mentioned, optical mice did away with this and instead had a light and a camera. Early prototypes required special surfaces with grid lines to work properly. However, improvements in processing chips and sensors removed this requirement and led to the most widely used mouse mechanism we have today. As an addendum, you might have noticed a lot of these early mice are missing something very useful, the scroll wheel. We can thank Microsoft for bringing this to the mainstream with the IntelliMouse of 19 1996. Specifically, we can thank Eric Michaelman and his team, who were trying to tackle the tedious problem of navigating a large spreadsheet with only a mouse and keyboard. Their solution was to use the scroll wheel for this, and by implementing software support in the office suite, they really brought this to something that was widespread. From those first optical mice, we've seen improvements in sensor technology, adding more buttons, ergonomics, accuracy. The last major milestone wasn't a huge one, but it was in 2004 when Logitech released the MX1000. The unique feature of this mouse was it used lasers instead of normal lights. Lasers have a very precise wavelength, and this meant that they're a lot more sensitive to the surface, allowing more surfaces to be used. And our story ends right about there, or at least what I've decided to cover. It's hard to say what the future of computer mice looks like. Computers are in a bit of decline, and there's an increasing use of touchscreens and laptops. We might even do away with physical inputs entirely with new technologies like VR. It took about 25 years for the mouse to go from its inception to becoming somewhat mainstream. What can we learn from this story? Well, it seems there's always technologies being developed, but until there's a good use case for them, they're not really going to move forwards. Controlling coordinate systems in the military just wasn't mainstream enough to make its way to the consumer. And it wasn't until we had larger companies like Xerox and Apple enter the fray that the development went from something janky in a research institute to something that was then supplied with a product. We can also see that software support is something that can be a useful way for these innovations to become more popular, like with the scroll wheel. Well, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. 
today. I hope this has been an interesting video. This is definitely different to the normal videos I make and took a lot more research. And I think I had this script lying around for about two years until I finally got around to recording it. So hopefully it's worth the wait. Do subscribe if you want to see more to the point content. I typically work on reviews, but if you'd like to see something like this again, please let me know in the comments. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.